thanks everyone for coming. Can we have another round of applause for the library for putting this event on? Alright, so at these Words with Wine events, normally you have the authors talk about something that is related to their book, and a lot of the times, based on events I've seen in the past, they're normally non-fiction books, so this is super easy. With a fiction book, a little bit harder to talk about stuff related to it without spoiling the whole thing. So, I thought I would talk about something which is probably the most common question that I get asked as a writer, and that is, where do you get your ideas from? For a long time, I just wasn't interested in this idea of ideas. I was far more interested in how you took something and made it into a story, and I you know, would go around saying, oh, ideas are cheap, it doesn't matter thinking about those at all. But I think I've since evolved in my thinking, and now I come to realize that there is such a thing as a bad idea that will never make a good story, no matter how talented you are, and vice versa, there are some good ideas which make it a lot easier to write a great story. So I know that not everyone here is a writer or wants to be a writer, so I thought I'd talk about creativity in general, because I think we can all agree that we probably all want to become more creative, right? Yeah. Yes, excellent. So, to me, one of the most common refrains or common roadblocks that people have when they are generating ideas or trying to come up with an idea is, none of my ideas are good, all of my ideas are bad. And I think the way to get over this is very much to think about it less as trying to come up with good ideas and more about trying to come up with more bad ideas. So if you are only coming up with, let's say, two ideas a day, what do you think are the odds that one of those is going to be an amazing idea? Probably not massive, right? If you are coming up with 20 ideas in a day and you don't care about the fact that they are good or bad, you're probably going to have slightly better success rate. So this is a process I use very much with my own writing, with the original notes that I took for the book, which were in this notebook, um, I was arriving at a story idea that I was pretty happy with, but I felt like it needed an extra edge. So I set myself the task of just brainstorming 10 completely different ideas that were alternate directions the story could unfold in. Uh, and most of these ideas were garbage, they were abysmal. But there were a couple of ideas in there which took the story in really interesting directions. And probably the biggest one of them is that I was brainstorming what are the most ridiculous things I could do to make this setting of the story unique. Um, because Across the Broken Stars is a fantasy book, and a lot of fantasy stories take place in this kind of like fake medieval Europe setting. Um, you know, like Game of Thrones is pretty much 1400s England. A lot of other fantasy, basically the same setting. And I love that setting as much as the next writer, but I wanted to try something a bit unique. So I set to brainstorming tons, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, probably should have looked that up before doing this talk, but I brainstormed a ton of different directions that I could use to make my setting something that was average into something that was unique and made the book stand out. Simply that concept just came around because I was willing to let myself experience some bad ideas. I was willing to let myself brainstorm and go into ridiculous directions and most of the directions were garbage, but that one direction that came out of it has gone on to become probably one of my favorite elements of the book. And based on some early reviews, it's been a lot of people's favorite element as well. So now that you have your idea, and just to draw this back a bit, this idea doesn't have to be about a story. Maybe it could be a conversation you want to have, a speech you want to give, a product you want to create, a business you want to create. Now that you have your idea, you're probably really tempted to do the thing that I always want to do when I have a new story idea. And that is to, much like I am now, tell as many people about it as possible. So this can be effective, but I would really caution against it. There's this great quote from Ovid, who was a Roman philo philosopher, I think it was say, uh, who was a Roman philosopher over 2,000 years ago. And he talks about how ideas are fragile. They can be destroyed by the merest frown or yawn. And with stories, this is certainly the case. You could have the coolest idea in your mind, and maybe you talk to someone, and maybe your idea isn't even that bad. Maybe they're just feeling tired on that day or whatever. Maybe they're going to have two hours sleep like rain over here. So they yawn in the middle of your idea, or they just aren't that interested. And what's the result? Maybe all of your hopes for that idea are now crushed. And you're never going to go away to write that story, to paint that artwork, to make that product, to start that business. So 
I would really advise caution when it comes to telling ideas to people before they are formed. And even if they don't crush your ideas, something actually worse could happen. And that worst thing is that they say that your idea is perfect. <laughs> now you might be wondering why that's worse. Let me tell you why that's worse. That's worse because whatever you create from that moment on, it will never be as perfect as the perfection that they thought your idea was going to be. If, they can't, if, you, if I tell someone a story idea and they're like, wow, Jeff, that's amazing, that's perfect, and they don't give me any critiques, where's my motivation to write the thing? Because they've already told me that this thing cannot be any better. They've already given me this upper limit, and even if I do achieve that limit, now I'm just meeting expectations. There's no real joy in that. And if I don't achieve that amazing, perfect execution of that perfect idea, which is what's more likely to happen, then you're probably going to be crushed even further. So, point number two there was all about being careful who you tell your ideas to in the early stage of the process. Point number three, and I'm going to stand over here because this is my contradictory argument to that one, <laughs> is that you should tell your ideas to people before you start. <laughs> so, with Across the Broken Stars, there were four people in particular who are all in this room, I believe, who I told the original, sorry, three are in this room, um, who I told the original pitch for the story to, back when it was, yep, I see you nodding. Uh, why don't I get you to stand up and embarrass you? James, stand up, Rebecca, stand up, Ray, stand up. Yeah, great. These were three of the four people who I originally told the story idea to way back in 2017. Uh, you can sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> and they helped me a lot because all of them are really talented writers and creators in their own uh, ways. and it really helped me figure out some plot holes, really helped me figure out some perhaps boring directions in the story, and as a result, I was able to fix those before I actually started writing the thing. So, if you are going to tell someone about your idea, you need to enter into it with a great constructive mindset. You need to think, I'm not going into this for affirmation, but rather, you need to be going into that to think about how you can work together as a team to make it better. And then the last point I want to talk about with ideas is that creativity is an activity. So I want to say that again, creativity is an activity because it's no good just having ideas in your head and never getting them out there. For me, a lot of people think about the idea of motivation as something that is required before you can have action. But I've found that with writing, it is the complete opposite. The action of writing an idea down, whether it is in my notebook, whether it's I'm writing a scene on the computer, whatever format it's in, when I start to write the thing, I could be feeling the most unmotivated and sluggish that I've ever felt, and there have been many times when I've started a writing session and super late and tired and I just want to go to sleep and I think that maybe I'll get five words down and it'll be great. And then I look up and like three hours have passed and there's 2,000 words on the screen somehow and I don't know how they got there. So creativity is an activity. The action of deploying your creativity, even if you don't feel very creative in that moment, for me, it always leads to more ideas and it generates a lot of extra motivation to pursue that. Um, one last thing I'd like to leave you with before I get into discussing the book is that there's never going to be a perfect time to start. You're never going to have the perfect amount of energy or the perfect idea or the perfect tools. There's only one thing you can do perfectly and that is to start. Thank you. So, Across the Broken Stars. Uh, actually, hands up if you have like, if you are familiar with the blurb, just to begin with. I'm curious. I want to know how effective my spamming was. <laughs> <laughs> Great, okay, excellent. So, Across the Broken Stars is a space fantasy adventure about this cowardly war deserter who is trying to redeem himself for his past failings by helping this young fugitive search for a mythical safe haven that may or may not exist. Like I mentioned before, the entire thing is set in a world where people live on discs that float in space. So it's not your average fantasy setting, uh, and I think that generates a lot of interesting conflicts and plot setups that you can't get in a normal fantasy book. So I'm going to read to you today the uh, first half of the first chapter in this book. Um, after I do the reading as well, I meant to mention this earlier, we're going to have a Q&A session, so if you thinking of any questions, this is a good time to prepare those so that we are not all stumped when that happens. <laughs> so, without further ado, 
going to be reading chapter one of Across the Broken Stars. Leon hated Orion airships, but since unloading them put beers on his table, he faked a smile as he picked up the crate. Good evening, Captain, he said. Hope you're falling to see him drown, he thought. The captain kept reading his book and reclined further in his chair. Scowling, Leon carried the crate out of the cabin, stumbling down the gangway to reach the old jetty. Wooden planks groaned underfoot, and waves slammed against the rocks, spraying him with freezing water. Above Leon, the airship's 400-foot balloon was long and cylindrical, tapering at the ends, with a cabin attached underneath. Straining at the moorings, the ship's anchor ropes twisted and creaked on either side of the jetty as Leon walked along, laboring under the heaviness of the crate. Towards the end of the jetty, he fumbled the slippery box, but kept hold, staggered off the jetty, then dumped the crate beside the 19 others he'd unloaded. His back twanged and he groaned. In his academy days, he could have hauled, hauled cargo through a swamp for hours, but now he was 43, and those days were behind him. He inhaled a lungful of salty air and rested his hands on his hips, puffing. Dozens of vessels crowded the harbour. Airships floated on the end of their anchor ropes. Fishing skiffs bobbed in the water, and Pegasus-drawn carriages rattled as they entered the harbour from a landing strip that led to the disk's edge. Out of all those vessels, of course the stupid harbour master had given Leon the biggest ship to unload. The captain strode along the jetty and walked past Leon, whistling. Like most Orions, he was a head shorter than a pair, but twice as stocky. Buttons gleamed on his jacket, and he bounced as he strolled towards the harbour office. It seemed he still hadn't adjusted to Hargold Disc's gravity, which was half as strong as the Orion's planet. Frick, thought Leon. Leon watched the captain disappear amongst the crowds of sailors. It wasn't enough that Beriah had bombed the hell out of Payer's discs in the invasion war, or that the airship's crates weighed more than an asteroid. No. On top of all that, Leon had to deal with arrogant captains who knew nothing about space travel, yet thought themselves too good to meet the Payer's eyes. Someone tapped Leon's shoulder. Leon de Velasco? He turned. A young woman stood before him, wrapped in a bulky, dirt-stained cloak. Her tall, slender frame marked her as a fellow pagan. Good. Leon didn't have to hide how annoyed he was at being interrupted. What? he asked. My name's Alina. I need your help. Her voice was a mixture of nervousness and excitement, but she had a confident firmness despite her youth. Leon raised an eyebrow. With disheveled, shoulder-length hair, a tangled beard, and ratty clothes that reeked of booze, he didn't get many requests for help, especially from young women. Got a ship you need unloaded? He asked. I. Two Varian soldiers swaggered past and bumped a linger. We'll catch them by tomorrow, chaps, one soldier said. Leon frowned. Most Payans looked down when the soldiers passed, but Alina glared at the Varians as they strutted away. You were saying? He said. I need to sail to another disc. What a bloody waste of time. He turned away. Can't help. I just unload cargo. Wait! She grabbed him. I know who you are. That ain't so, or you wouldn't have come to me. He shrugged her off and strode towards the harbour master's office, hoping that entering an official building would intimidate Alina and make her go away. She chased him. Please, you have to help. Leon ducked under a Pegasus wing. The four-legged creature neighed and shook its mane, stepping away from Leon as he passed. Alina kept following him. Told you, I ain't a sailor, said Leon. The harbour master's office was on the other side of the pack of merchants. Leon would be rid of Alina within seconds. She shoved something soft into his hand. I know who you are. Karen Swan's girl, I ain't. He looked at what she'd handed him. It was a feather. Panic surged through Leon. 
The feather was grey, long and broad, filling the full width of his palm. He hadn't seen anything like it in the 20 years since the war. If a Orion found it, they were both dead. Leo stuffed the feather in his pocket, dragged Alina down the alley beside the harbour master's office, then shoved her against the wall. Where'd you get that? He asked in a low voice. You have to tell me where you found it. I need your help. Her voice wavered. I know who you are, and you need to know you're not the last. Laughter swelled from inside the harbour master's office. Alina gasped. She tore herself from Leon's grip with surprising strength. Have to go, she said. Can't let him see me, but I'll find you, okay? She sprinted down the alley, vanishing into the shadows. Leon clenched his hand into a white knuckled fist and strode out of the alley, back into the harbor. This couldn't be real. He'd hidden his secret for two decades, but now, she can't know, can she? A Orion Inquisitor limped out of the Harbour Master's office, flanked by soldiers. The Inquisitor's left leg scraped along the cobblestones, and his foot was twisted at a painful right angle to his body. He leaned on a cane and winced at each dragging step. Leon's skin crawled. He thought his war wounds were bad, but for this man, every stride would be agonizing. The Inquisitor saw Leon. Ah, you're the chap that unloaded my airship, aren't you? What's your name? Leon bowed deeply, taking the moment to steady his breath. Leon, sir. The Inquisitor bowed back. That was nice. Most Marines didn't understand pay and adequate, and tried to shake his hand instead of offering the normal greeting. The Inquisitor gave him a handful of coins. My gratitude for a job well done. Leon blinked. No Orions had directly paid him before. Normally, the harbour master paid all the workers at the day's end. Thank you, Inquisitor. The man smiled, but the smile didn't reach his cold eyes. My dear chap, what's that in your cloak? Leon glanced down. The feather stuck out of his pocket. Leon's guts twisted. Trying to stop his hand from shaking, he grabbed it and showed the Inquisitor. Found it in the sea. The Inquisitor hobbled closer, leaning on his cane. Leon's nose twitched. The man reeked of Yona, a foul-smelling painkiller pace. Don't be nervous, the Inquisitor said. I'm just looking. It's a rather magnificent feather, dear chap. What creature do you suppose it came from? Don't know, lied Leon. A pegasus? The Inquisitor leaned toward the feather. Ha! Not even close. Sweat ran down Leon's face. Say... The Inquisitor stepped back, and Leon breathed out. May I take that? Yes, of course, sir. The Inquisitor took the feather. He pulled out a sack that jangled with Doric's and gave it to Leon. Leon looked inside. Those coins represented more than he'd earned in a month. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. The Inquisitor examined the feather. This may be just what I need. Now, Leon, if you find another feather, or anyone who has them, there's more Dorics in my pocket for you. Come to the castle and tell them you have a message for Walter Drayton. How's that sound, dear fellow? Leon thought of Alina. Excellent, sir. Inquisitor Drayton's gaze lingered on Leon. Then he hobbled away. His cane tapped on the cobblestones, and his twisted foot scraped along the ground. The soldiers clanked after him. Another wave smashed against the shore spraying Leon with water. He clenched his teeth. He'd been safe for 20 years, but now he saw how flimsy that safety had been. And that's the end of the first thing. All right, so now it's time for questions and answers.
Does anyone have a question of this author up here? <laughs> yes, Leash. Um, it's so rich in details about the characters' traits and about the setting and all of those things. What happens if you get to the end of the book and you come up with another idea about one of those details? Do you then have to go back right to the beginning and go, did that happen in this book? Did you like, was there anything that you thought of after you had started and then you had to go through it? Or did you already have a really clear idea of what the characters were going to be like in the setting and it was just uniform the whole way through? Great, so the question is like, how did it sort of change from um, my initial conception to, yeah? Yeah. Great, yeah, so I'm a big outliner. Um, I plan out pretty much my entire story before I even put the first word down. Uh, as I mentioned before, I pitched this story to a couple of friends as well, so that was before I had even written the first word. That um, being said though, the original first draft of this was 60,000 words, and the final thing is 80,000 words. So I added in, yeah, like an extra 33% to the story over the course of various drafts, which is pretty rare for fantasy writers. Normally fantasy writers have the problem of writing something that's like a massive doorstopper and then having to cut stuff out of it. Um, but for whatever reason, I felt like it was a bit short to begin with. So to answer your question, uh, particularly with that first scene, a lot of those details were more or less there from the start. Um, a couple of things got refined a bit. Um, I probably couldn't tell you what they are exactly, but yeah, more or less, um, I'm constantly yeah, wanting to add in extra details. I find that even though I'm a very visual person, for some reason I never seem to have enough setting description in my first drafts. So one of the things that I work on going through is you know, working and layering up that setting so that you can smell what's happening in the scene, so that you can see you know, what's happening, because you don't want a story where it feels like they're just walking through this two-dimensional, you know, paper mache set. You want something that feels rich and like, that you could write a whole other story in after this one. That's a good question. Other questions? Rain. So, <clears throat> sorry. You've talked about the book predominantly as like a fantasy novel, but it is kind of marketed as very much like a sci-fi, and is in mm. very much like a sci-fi setting in many ways. Do you, given that the conventions for the two genres are quite different, do you see it as more of one or the other or a blend of the two or? Yeah, I mean, I, I have the cop out of saying it's a space fantasy novel, so it's <laughs> sort of like the best of both worlds. Um, that is definitely something I noticed as well. In a couple of the early reviews that have been coming in, someone will describe it as saying like, oh, this is a like a great sci-fi world. And then someone else is like, oh, what a great fantasy novel. And I'm like, oh, I kind of want to put both of these reviews up on the same page, but it might be confusing to people. Um, I think, like, for me, what made it interesting to write was the mashing up of those two genres, uh, rather than just writing something that is, like, straight sci-fi with spaceships and, like, laser guns, per se. Um, not per se. Uh, and not having something that was just classically fantasy. I would say that, on balance, though, it probably falls more into the fantasy category, because, for me, the distinction between those two things is that in... Sci-fi, the plot is generated from, uh, you know, like technology and stuff that you can sort of like rationally understand. Whereas in fantasy, it is more about like magic and things that you don't really have a full understanding of. And while there is certainly technology in this book that you do have a good understanding of, a lot of the mystique of the character's quest towards finding this mythical safe haven is wrapped up in things that they don't understand and things that are beyond their comprehension. Yeah, that's, that was definitely a big consideration uh, writing it. <coughs> Next question. Chloe. What was the guy with the feather's name? The guy with the feather's name. Do you mean the main character's name? Yeah. Leon. <laughs> his, in, in case you need a reminder, it's, his name is the first word on the back of the books. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Chelsea. Um, was there at any point when you were like writing it out or when you were starting to write it, did you forget any details that you really wanted to put in? And when it came to like putting it all together, did you have to draw it out or like put it into something to get the actual idea of what you want to see people seeing? 
Okay, so the question is, were there details that I forgot when I was writing it initially, and then, like, did I use, like, drawing and stuff, or just other ways to explore it? Um, I'm trying to think. The problem with, like, writing the story is that this probably went through maybe about, like, eight or nine different drafts over, from the end of 2017 to uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it is hard to, like, distinguish what things were there originally and what things were not. Um, ooh, this is a tricky one. I know that I definitely did draw out some set pieces, which were like a little bit complicated, so I needed to get my mind around how. Um, for instance, like this isn't a spoiler, but towards the end of the book, there is like a uh, I don't know if I say too much more, it will be a spoiler. Um, <laughs> towards the end of the book, the last setting where the climax takes place, I needed to draw out a diagram of how it worked so that I could understand how to describe it in my writing, if that makes sense. Um, I guess like having come from an architecture background of having uh, used to be an architecture student, normally that kind of spatial stuff comes fairly easily to me, so I don't have to draw it out as much. In terms of details that I wanted to include, but didn't include. I don't think there were many of those, but as I mentioned before, there were a ton of things where I reread it at the end uh, after I'd done my first draft and realized that it just needed more fleshing out and it needed more exploration of different parts in the world and everything. Yeah, that was really good. Yes, Rob. Uh, when you're working, how do you split your time between <coughs> actually working on the book and writing and outlining and doing the work outside of that marketing it and sending your emails out and, and, and that kind of thing. How do you decide? Yes. Um, that's, so the question is, uh, how do I split my time between writing and marketing and stuff? I'm just repeating it for the microphone. Um, yeah, so it was, for this one it was really easy because I like had, was doing zero marketing and I was just writing it um, and it was like well before I started publishing stuff. So it wasn't as much an issue for that back then. Um, Nowadays, it is yeah definitely harder to get that balance and something that I don't think I still have right at the moment. But things that I have found useful are writing in the morning. Um, I never used to be a morning writer. Like when I first started writing this, I was on exchange and I would probably stay up to like one in the morning writing things, which was like not great when I had to get to class at like seven the next day or whatever. But um, nowadays, I'm very much a morning writer. I find that if I can normally start writing, um, let's see, I get up, I try to get up about five in the morning and then ideally I'm writing by like six-ish or so. It doesn't always work out like that, but that's normally when I'm trying to start writing. I'll go for ideally about three hours in the morning uh, and that should get me about anywhere between maybe one and a half thousand to three thousand words. Um, and you've got to bear in mind that because I have outlined this thing before very extensively, I'm not, when I'm writing something, I'm not really thinking about it. It's just I'm putting the words that I already knew needed to be there in the first place. And then afternoons are for marketing and stuff like that. But um, yeah, with the marketing, I still need to probably get a lot better at working out how to structure my time effectively for that in the afternoon. So good question from a marketing person yourself. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yes? Did you ever encounter any um, like creative roadblocks? or challenges, and how did you overcome those? Great, I love how you sidestepped around the word writer's block. Do you know that I hate that word? Or? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I detest that word. Uh, yeah, so the question was, did I, over, did I face any roadblocks uh, creatively, slash writerly speaking? Um, with this one, definitely not in the first draft, because I had it all outlined very clearly um, and it was a pretty fast writing process as well. Like I said, it was maybe like five days or so to outline it and then about 60 days to write the first draft, which is like insanely fast even for me. Um, like my first book took me exactly a year minus five days to write. So this was a big step up to write this one a lot quicker. Um, so I didn't really face any roadblocks in that part of the process. I would say the part that I maybe came close to facing like challenges with was probably later stages of revision. Um, because as with any creative project, you get very close to your own thing and it can be hard to uh, step back and figure out what is working. Um, so the two things that I found really useful for fixing that was 
just taking a break from it and working on other stuff, or um, like talking to other writer friends about the problems I was going through and trying to figure out how to um, fix those. The reason why I just looked away from the distance sandwich is because I realized there was actually a big roadblock that I totally forgot about until just then, so thank you for reminding me. Um, the roadblock was the first draft was 60,000 words. And most people expect a fantasy novel to be something that like, can entertain them for a while. Um, if you like, go to the fantasy books in this library, you will probably find that their average word counts are somewhere around about maybe like 120 to 150,000 words. So I was aware that it was like a bit underweight, I suppose. So the roadblock that I faced was, how do I expand this without putting in useless fodder that readers are bored by? Um, and the way I overcame that was very much by just thinking, how could I give certain character moments more time to breathe so that they had more impact? How could I explore different corners of the world that I hadn't explored already? Uh, and probably the big one as well is thinking about ways that I can introduce more try-fail cycles for the character. So these are where like character tries one course of action, fails, has a setback, plans another course of action, tries again. Some of the things were happening a bit too easily in that first draft. So by making more try-fail try cycles happen, um, it allowed me to expand it out to 80,000 words of stuff that I feel all needs to be there. I don't think in the final thing um, there is like any excess padding or whatnot. That's a really good question. Very writerly question. That's good. <laughs> yes, Mitch. Um, the main character, Leon, is uh, 43. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. So, and he seems like something of an, an old hero type character. Um, I find, I, in my, I imagine that these types of characters can be sometimes quite difficult to write, especially when you're not. 43 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any real life or perhaps some fiction like Indiana Jones type characters that might have inspired you to, to help capture that sort of perspective? Yeah, so that's a really great question. I am 22 as of today, so I am not 43. Um, so yeah, the question was, how did I write someone who comes from a very different background to me, Leon being 43, maybe being significantly younger? Um, Leon has actually probably been, I would say, maybe the easiest character that I've ever written. It just felt like coming from a previous novel where I was writing, uh, so just to give a bit of context, my first book that I wrote um, was called The Aeon Academy. It was about this young orphan who went to this superhero school. It was really derivative. I worked on it for like five years and it wasn't <laughs> going anywhere. Um, it was basically like Harry Potter but with superpowers. So. One of the things that I found really great about Across the Broken Stars is that because Leon was so much older, there was all this backstory to him that I could explore. Whereas when you're writing a protagonist who's 12 or whatever, it's like much more difficult to have all of these like tragic dark things that have happened in their backstory that you can you know have cool character moments and cool plot things about. So in that regard, Leon was actually really easy to write. Um, and obviously I didn't learn from my mistake because the current thing I'm writing features a really young protagonist, so hard to get the backstory in it again. But um, in terms of inspirations for him, I'm so glad you said Indiana Jones because the three big films that have probably inspired this are definitely Indiana Jones for that whole uh, concept of like this mythical place that may or may not exist um, and sort of going into these like trapped tombs to uncover you know, ancient riddles to get through them and stuff. Definitely that element was a big part of it. Um, the other big inspiration as well was Logan, the Wolverine movie. And a lot of, uh, I suppose, Leon's characteristics were definitely inspired by Logan, who, if you're not familiar with that movie, basically it's this uh, road trip with two mutants with superpowers across this post-apocalyptic sort of landscape. Um, between this like father and his sort of estranged daughter uh, and the way that their characters sort of align and help each other over the course of that uh, creates some really interesting moments throughout it. So that was definitely a big inspiration for this. The way I think about inspiration in particular is to whenever I find myself doing something that's similar to another story, 
is I try to work out, okay, I like this story, what do I like about this story? What are the emotions that I enjoy experiencing when I read this thing? And that is the thing that I try to extract and develop and take my own spin on, um, even though the aesthetic of everything is very different. So even though it's set in a completely different world, it's very, it has like some of those great emotional experiences that you would have from the things that have inspired me. That was a really good question, yes. Next question. Yes. How did you find Sorry. your writing style and has your writing style actually changed in between like books and in between genres and things like that? So all of the books I've written so far are fantasy, so the genres haven't changed that much. Um, my writing style, I think you can definitely find First of all, I think style is something that is hard to force, but sort of develops naturally once you've done it for a while. Um, and like, I wouldn't say I've done it necessarily for like a while, but I've definitely noticed some common patterns in uh, my writing. Particularly, probably the biggest one is that I like to set my stories in worlds that are quite different from ours. Uh, whether that means that the setting is in space, as with this book, whether it means that there's like these cool magic systems that are going on in the world, um, as with Fires of the Dead. Um, so that's probably the biggest like stylistic thing that you can expect from a lot of my books. In terms of the actual language that I write it in, um, which I feel like is probably more of a, the style question. Um, yeah, I guess I very much favor quite concise prose. Um, for a, Rain is laughing because for a long time my literary hero was Ernest Hemingway because he just seemed really brief and concise and I hadn't read a single Hemingway book so I was basically just going off the idea that oh yeah this guy is really concise this should be good um, I actually read one of his books and didn't like it at all so that was a crushing experience but I think my style is very much characterized by yeah it's you can probably expect like fairly concise um, language. I'm not one for massively like flowery, purpley prose. There are some moments where the story deserves it, and you will get some of that. But yeah, I'm I'm more focused on. Um, I guess there's two ways to think about language in a book. The first way is to see. This is handy. I've got a prop over here. So, two theories about writing prose in a book. The first way is that you see the prose as a clear window, whose purpose is just to let readers see into the story as clearly as possible. The other way to think about it is to consider the prose as this stained glass window, which is really beautiful in itself, and a lot of the focus is on actually analysing the window and examining that, rather than seeing what's beyond. So I definitely fall more into the clear window so that readers have you know, the least interruption between them and the story kind of thinking. Yes, Neil. Yes, so the question is, uh, do I write books in parallel or do I just write like one at a time? Um, I try very much, as much as possible, to just write them one at a time because I think a story is something that uh, you kind of need to, well, at least for me, I kind of need to be focusing on it all the time. And if I bring too many other influences in and I'm working on too many other things, it can be a bit scattering. Um, having said that, with recent projects, uh, specifically the book I'm writing at the moment, I have been trying to write that while doing all the launch stuff for this book, which has been an interesting experience because I've been constantly kind of swapping back and forth between, say, like writing the first draft of the new book in the mornings and then like having to edit this book in the afternoon. The thing that kind of works about that for me at least though is that editing and writing use different parts of my brain. So it's fine for me to spend like the morning writing a new thing and then after lunch to swap gears and do the editing for something else. But yeah, I think I'm probably gonna be having to do more of that in the future just because of how it works in terms of like one book is ready to be revised, another book needs to be written sort of thing. Up until this stage though, it has been very much single tasking on it. So that will be my focus after this launch is over and everything is just trying to focus uh, solely on writing the new thing and hopefully it will be even more productive 
because there isn't the kind of like cloud of the other thing um, that you have to work on as well. That's a great question. Um, you talked about the fact that you're a really big outliner. Um, are there any writing strategies that you stay far away from? Some people just completely write free form, some people write out of order. Is there any that is just not for you? Okay, so the question is, are there any writing strategies that I never use? Um, so yeah, writers tend to fall into two camps. The first one is outline writers who plan everything out beforehand, and the second category is discovery writers who just sort of like maybe throw some interesting characters into a situation and then just see what unfolds from there. Both approaches are totally valid. For me personally, I've definitely found that discovery writing works when I'm doing short, short stories, but like outlining is usually always going to produce a cleaner draft for me. So yeah, I very much prefer the outlining method. In terms of things that I have never done, which are often like recommended to writers, one is this idea of writing like a character dossier, like asking your fictional character interview style questions to try to figure out what they're about. Um, I have never done that. I just don't find it useful to know like what Leon's favorite color is or whatever, or like what he likes to eat for breakfast. That's just not an interesting question. Uh, actually, what he eats for breakfast probably would tell me a bit about the world. But like, point being, most of the times that stuff doesn't excite me as much because it's like, very surface level things that don't affect the story. Um, other writing techniques or things that I try to stay clear of. Um, I mean, there's nothing that I'm like opposed to as a blanket rule because this sounds like such a, a like pretentious artist thing to say, but it's all about like what's right for the story that you're writing. Um, I guess stuff that I haven't done a lot is having like multiple point of views in a story. I know I did that for my previous book, but that was like the first book where, actually no, I didn't, no, never mind. I have done it for other books. Um, yeah, look, I'm drawing like, there's not many techniques that I will never use. The way to think about them is, yeah, just as a toolbox and it's, it matters what's useful at the moment for you to pull out and there's nothing that I would not try. Um, yeah, all, all things work. I've done weird styles of writing. Sometimes I would just like, open the voice app on my phone and just talk for 20 minutes and see what comes from there. Yeah, it just, it depends on what I'm writing, basically. Kind of a wishy-washy answer, but there we go. More questions? Yes, Ken. It's always interesting to know the writer behind the book. You talk about creativity, but at the same time, you need a lot of discipline to get up at six, eight, uh, five o'clock and then start writing at yeah. six a.m. So what motivates you as a writer? and also in this particular genre that you have chosen to write in. Cool, so yeah, the question is what motivates me as a writer um, and like how do you get disciplined for it? Weirdly enough, writing is actually easier for me than not writing. Um, like I told this to a couple of friends and they like find it strange, but for me, if I go like a couple of days without writing, I actually start to feel like sort of physically ill because it's, it's reached a stage where it's an addiction for me. Um, and it's like, I think it's a healthy addiction, but basically I'm at the stage where, yeah, like I, it's easier for me to write than it is for me not to write. So the motivation is really not that difficult. Um, but having said that, it definitely helps being consistent. And um, for me, one of the big things that's helped my motivation a lot is tracking all of my word counts. So again, this, like, you can probably sense a pattern here between like, outlining, tracking word counts. Like I'm a very analytical style of person, even though you know writers are supposed to be creative and like free flowing or whatever. But um, for me, I track all my daily word counts in a big spreadsheet and that's really great because I can quickly see that I've done like 10 days of writing in a row and I don't want to miss that. Or I can see that I'm averaging uh, however many words for the year and I want to increase my words per day average or whatnot. So tracking it really helps with my motivation. Um, in terms of why I write in general and why I write fantasy, I guess fantasy is probably just my favorite genre. Um, a lot of people sort of like have negative thoughts about fantasy and everything, but the way I think about it is fantasy lets you do literally anything that you can do in another genre, just in a genre where it's also optional to have like dragons or magic. <laughs> so like you can have a heist story in a fantasy book, you can have a romance story in a fantasy book, you can have a 
like thriller and a fantasy book. Literally anything can fit into it. Um, and also I just like the fact that fantasy is honest because all stories are made up. Fantasy is just honest about the fact that it's made up, I think. <laughs> James. Um, it's kind of just touching a bit on what you just said and what you're talking before about your, inspira your inspirations for the book. Yeah, you're more talking about like inspirations for character building and stuff. So I know, I think that's attractive to a lot of fantasy writers is that element of world, world building, but it's also a bit of a double-edged sword where it's almost <laughs> like the hardest thing to approach as a writer is you're trying to flesh out this whole world and the languages and different cultures. Um, but so how do you approach world building in regards to like what you want to tackle and stuff that you just go, I don't need to worry about yeah, like what foods like people are eating yeah. every day for like breakfast, lunch and dinner and then just touching on that what are your inspirations as far as the setting goes because it is a unique setting um say so like you still married i guess with like dune which is kind of like the king of like fantasy oh, set in space yeah yeah, but, yeah. literally just had that order to my house like two days ago yeah good choice yeah <laughs> um so the question was how do i go about world building in fantasy so um, when I'm like approaching a new story, really what I'm trying to do, whether I am brainstorming like a character or a plot or the world or whatever, really I'm trying to figure out what the theme of the story is about. So theme is, um, like you probably have bad misconceptions of it from school. I know there's some teachers in here, so sorry. But the way the theme is taught in school is just, I think, abysmal. Um, <laughs> most people think that theme is like subject matter, as in, Oh, this is a story about love, or death, or redemption. Um, but that is not how I like to think about theme. I like to think about theme as a question, or an argument. So, um, I won't kind of give away what the theme is for this, but, for example, if I was going to write a story about money, my theme would not be money. My theme might be something like, um, you know, like, money is evil, right? That's a really basic way of looking at it. Now, to make that interesting, what I would then do is flesh out that question from both sides of it. So I would have a character who's like, yes, money is really evil. It does bad things to people's morals or whatever. Then I would have another character who's like, money's not evil. You can use it to like donate to charities and make the world better or whatever. And then you would have a whole bunch of other characters who all have different reflections on that theme of the story. So the reason why I bring that up is because that's how I think about world building. It's very much about how can I use this world building to reflect the story's theme or to explore it in interesting and different ways? So for instance, um, in this book here, the world building, yes, like it is something that I would probably be able to write other stories in and stuff, but a big consideration was making sure that it's not just this world that's like wacky and cool for the sake of being cool, but the fact that it's this world where civilization is living on these kind of like sort of discs where they don't really know how they were made. There's sort of this like magical mystique to them and everything, and there's things hidden within them. It's kind of a reflection of what the theme is about in a way. So when I think about world building, I think about like how I can, you know, link the story's premise to the world building. And basically what you want to have is a story that feels cohesive. Um, yeah, so that's like, I can talk about world building all day. It's probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, in writing stories, I'm sure you enjoy it as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably the like the really quick answer to it is, for me, the world building becomes meaningful and not just cool when it is about the theme of the story and when it like reflects on character and forces character to grow and everything. Yeah, great fancy all the question. <laughs> yes, Montana. Um, does the book stay in the third person? Does the book stay in third person all the time? Yes, it does. Uh, the entire story is told from Leon's perspective. There are, this is not a spoiler, oh, I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but not really. There are, like, are no chapters that are told from other characters' perspective, and that was very intentional because you get a lot of fantasy books which have like 20 different point of view characters, um, and then you run into like the Game of Thrones problem where you're like, how do we wrap this up in one season? We can't because there's 50 people whose stories we need to explore. <laughs> so, I wanted to write something that was like a bit tighter and focused on one person. In terms of how I decide what the point of view is, um, 
for the first four books that I've written, it wasn't a decision at all. It was just third person point of view because that's the thing that I've trained the most in. That's the thing that I feel most comfortable in. Um, and that's when you have, for instance, like he walked over to get the box. That's third person. Um, with the thing that I'm writing at the moment, I intentionally changed the point of view to first person because the entire story is the main character recounting his life effectively. So to make that work, it just made sense for it to be, you know, first person recounting. So yeah, again, it comes back to what do I think is the most natural for this story? Um, and if there's none which are particularly natural to this story, I will probably default to the third person because that's just the one that I am probably the best with. Yeah. Was it a, yes, Sint. Yeah, so the question is like, what did the initial inspiration for this look like? Um, this was a bit different. Like some, most of my story ideas come to me as like, oh, here's this one little cool concept and I'll forget about it. And then three months later, I'll think about something else and then we'll interact with that other concept. And I'm like, oh, there's a story here. With this one, um, I'm just getting the notebook out because this is where the original ideas were. So it pretty much all came to me um, within the space of like people who are like wanting to write stuff are probably going to find this really annoying but this book literally came to me in about an hour and a half um which is yeah like very rare uh i'm just flipping to where it was at the start so yeah pretty much this is my november 1st 2017 these are my original notes for it um oops i probably shouldn't show you all those because there might be spoilers there but uh <laughs> Basically, I, yeah, looking through this, I pretty much outlined the entire plot of the story, um, yeah, in like one night. So it's a, yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes you just get really lucky. So with this story in particular, it was very much a case of like, oh, I feel like I can write some stuff down in my notebook. And then I look up two hours later and I'm like, where did that come from? There's an entire book here that just wrote itself. Um, that is very convenient, definitely doesn't happen with everything. Um, but I do remember the like initial kind of concept behind it that I was aiming for was very much that I wanted to tell a story set after the obvious story. So we get a lot of fantasy books that are about like a young boy or girl training at this kind of magical academy to master their special skills or whatever, and they may or may not be an orphan with like a, a lightning bolt scar on their head. Um, <laughs> very specific, not really specific, but a reference. Um, with this book, there is an academy in it where this special class of people train, but that happened 20 years before the book starts. So this is a book about, okay, let's say there was something like this academy, and the main character went to it and everything. And now it's 20 years past then, there was a big war, everyone else who was trained at the academy has been destroyed, the world has radically changed, how is this character dealing with that? So I very much wanted to tell a story that was about kind of the burden of the past and how you redeem yourself for failings of the past. Um, and yeah, what it means to kind of like be living in a world that is sort of post the obvious story. So that was very much my initial inspiration was to tell a story that was set after the story that was my first kind of like intuitive thought as to what the story should be. Great question. Anyone else? Yes. Were there any parts of this your original idea that you had to let go that didn't work yeah. out and you had to throw away? Great question. Um, so the question was, were there any parts of my original story that I had to let go of? Um, this is another hard one to remember. My, first of all, if you want to find out for sure, you can actually read the entire first draft of this book. Um, there is, where is it? Over by the books there, there's like a list to sign up to my newsletter. Um, and if you sign up to that, I'm gonna send everyone who's here like some bonuses, like the original first draft, my original outline, my companion short story and everything. So you can check that out if you're interested. Um, it, like I would read the 
the full book before you read the first draft. <laughs> it's, it's better, I swear. Um, I don't think there were many things that I had to cut, mainly because it was really short as a, as a book. It was 60,000 words and I had to add an extra 20,000. So most of my revision for this was very much about adding in stuff to it. Stuff that I had to cut, um, I mean, originally the setting, like, I guess a really basic thing was originally I wanted to set it on just an ordinary planet that was actually going to be the planet of another story I had outlined. Um, and then I was like, no, I want it to be its own thing. And then from that sort of came the space and stuff. So, yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't think there were many things I cut. Like, the, all of the characters who are in it were either in the original draft or were added in. Um, all of the places they go to, yeah, in the original draft. I'm pretty sure it was, it was mainly a process of adding. Probably that's because I outlined it very heavily, so I probably was doing the cutting before I even started writing. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Dasha. Um, just in your little notebook, like, yes. for your first, like, outline, did you do, like, every single scene? Or how, like, detailed was it? Was it, like... Um, so the question is, oh, is anything else? Okay, so the question was in my original outline, did I do literally every scene? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I definitely know that the first scene had about like four pages of notes for it because I was really excited. Uh, and then I was pretty much like, the quest starts and they do the thing for a bit until they get here. So, <laughs> like literally probably the first three chapters have three pages written on them and then maybe chapters five through to 20 were just like, get them from this location to this location, make them argue a bit, set up their characters. <laughs> so it wasn't completely outlined in the notebook. Once I actually went into writing the proper outline, which was in a Word document, then it became more fleshed out, and then I was like, okay, I actually need to work out how to get between these locations. Which did you have a question? I have a really high question. I love this question. Um, I want to know what writing gives you? Like, why are you so drawn to writing? What is it, what means does it fulfill for you on such a high level that it's such a magnetic thing in your life? Great question. Um, yeah, so the question is, like, what does writing sort of give me that maybe nothing else can? Yeah. I think the amazing thing about writing is... I mean, I'm going to chuck out some cliches to begin with, but then that's just warming you up when I get really existential later in this answer. But um, for me, like, I think a big part of it is improving my empathy and trying to like understand other people and like other ways of living to my own experience. Because you're only going to get like one life within your own body, but whenever you read or whenever you create your own story, that allows you to sort of like live lots of other lives and from that hopefully learn some lessons which are useful um, or at the very least just be entertained and be grateful that you're like not the person who's having to go through the horrible things that the author is dishing out to the character. Um, that's the really like basic low level answer to that but you started this question with, this is going to be a high level question so I'll give you the really high level question for it. Um, I didn't fully understand this until my third year of architecture, where my lecturer had this fantastic quote from, um, I believe it was like an, I don't actually know what he was, I think he was a philosopher, Ignacy Solomorales. And he says that good architecture is a window into a more intense reality. It's a thing that allows us to engage with and experience the world in a deeper way than if that great architecture wasn't to exist. And if you've been to, you know, amazing places like the Pantheon or like pyramids or, you know, you can think about these architectural spaces where you walk in and you just feel changed by being there. It's like this really sublime experience. Um, and for me, that's sort of what writing gives me. It gives me a way to engage uh, more deeply with reality by exploring different realities and by exploring different ways of interacting with the world and, and different people. And I think... Um, yeah, like the most rewarding part about writing is that, that feeling of, of sublimeness you get when you are kind of in the flow state in the story and it's just sort of coming out of you without you actually being conscious of how it's happening. Um, and it feels, yeah, for want of a better word, like really magical. Um, and yeah, for me that's, that's what writing 
I guess, gives me its, it's like the best form of entertainment possible because not only am I writing something that is like fun for me to read in, you know, like a year later, two years later, three years later, but it's like the, the process of creating it is so like intoxicatingly addictive for want of a better word um, that I'm now at the point where, like I said before, it's so much harder for me not to write than it is for me to write because I just love it so much. Yep, one last question. Yep, play. <laughs> Am I bullying the character? Absolutely. Because <laughs> I don't bully people in real life. <laughs> to put someone else on the spot here, Marcus, can you stand up? Please, please, Marcus. Stand up. <laughs> so, no, no, not bullying. I mean, this is Marcus is one of the like best human beings I know in the world. He just came back from being in Bangladesh, uh, doing a lot of charity work over there. Um, you do not want to play him in a board game because he is vicious in a board game. <laughs> and I, my theory is, thanks, Marcus. You can thank you for being my prop. My theory is that because he's such a great person in real life, the board games are like the outlet to get the aggression out, and that's sort of how I view writing, right? Like. It just, it just helps me live more peacefully, knowing that there's all these characters who've had to go through horrible things because of my decisions. Good one. It is. Right. Thank you. All right, so, um, yeah, we are going to have book signings and purchases at the back. Uh, just one thing I'm going to say really quickly again is if you want to sign up to my email newsletter for updates on my writing and, like I mentioned, the original first draft, outline of this book and some bonus stuff like a companion short story. There is a uh, like table over there um, that you can fill out if you want to join that. Um, the books are, it's $20 for a paperback, $40 for a hardback, but we only have like two of those, uh, so you gotta get in quick if you want one of those. Um, yeah, scarcity. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. So I will be over there in a second if you have more questions to, oh yes, there's more wine yeah, and food over here. Yeah, good call. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much for being an amazing morning. Explosions like a heartbeat. Yeah, my mind's keen. Rushes of emotion. Now let's do it again. The sweetness and adventure. Without adventure, TV's got your monster on good reality. Much more.